Hello fellow creatives, welcome to my channel where I share arts and crafts ideas for beginners. For the month of July I have been practicing making art daily with the aim of ending the month with some finished art. After completing four canvases I decided to take on a bigger challenge and paint this portrait of my new kitten Nala. I began the month feeling both anxious and excited about making art. It didn't help that I fell ill in the second week of the month. If you'd like to see how I progressed to this piece, then you might like to check out my July vlog, which I will have linked in the end cards and description below. At the beginning of this year, I listened to the audiobook Art and Fear by David Bales and Ted Orland. I listened to it again recently and I think that the ideas they explore and advice they offer in adopting the correct mindset to overcome fears about making art must have been processing in the cognitive background, so to speak. I say this because, although I did feel a little challenged and tried to talk myself out of doing this portrait, I felt the drive to step up to the challenge that I wouldn't normally. My reasoning was just to start and see where the process takes me. The best case scenario would be a finished piece of artwork that I could be proud of. The worst would be some wasted paint on a canvas that I could easily wash off. I think that by doing daily practices to warm up my muscles and mentally prepare myself to make finished art did help. But that's only half the story. The motivation to create simply was not consistent throughout the month, where some days I felt like pushing through the challenges, while on other days I felt I had reached the limits of my skills and couldn't carry on. In this video, I hope to share some of the key takeaways from the book that helped me change some of my fears around making finished art. For the sake of time and in keeping to YouTube's algorithm, I will only refer to what was covered in the introduction and chapter 1 and end by stating what I understood to be the underlying message of the book. If you would like to listen to the full audiobook, I will have it linked in the description below. The authors begin their discussion on why humans developed art and see art as being an intimately human activity that ordinary people engage in. Despite the assumptions and grand claims made about the born artist, whose natural or divinely bestowed talent can never be acquired through regular practice and perseverance, even if one were to cry sweat and blood. They argue that art can be learned and mastered by any determined individual. As working artists themselves who face daily challenges in producing art, the authors state simply that difficulties in making art are universal and it is their combined experiences of the difficulties and the ways to overcome them that inform this book. Their conceptual understanding of the world is summed up as a place where free will can be exercised over predestination and therefore choice above chance. In chapter 1, the authors talk about the various reasons why making art can be difficult for most artists, which then leads to work being left incomplete or abandoned altogether. At times, this happens before the artist has even mastered her choice of materials. At other times, it is because the artist has exhausted the limits of his materials, yet he continues using them to the detriment of his growth and progress. So why does art get made? The authors posit that the changing needs in the cultural landscape result in the various uses and purposes for art being made. In the past, art was made for the purpose of the community or in service to God, i.e. places of worship. In more recent times, art has become more of a personal pursuit that the artist engages in without much approval from society or the endowed patronage of a monarch. Except for maybe a few close people and fans, there isn't usually a mass audience waiting to receive or react to the art produced. Consequently, the artist's motivation and efforts may never garner the attention or reward for the time spent on making art. 
With so little to gain from the outside world, what then must we do to push past the doubts and uncertainty, to make and continue making art? The authors suggest firstly to push past the lack of interest of a target audience becoming our primary factor in deciding if and when art gets made. By pushing past the myriad concerns including reaching an audience, negative thoughts and self-doubt, we must find nourishment in doing the work itself and over time discover the direction our art is heading towards. Personally, I do find the act of creating lifts my mood and ironically revitalizes my energy when I am genuinely engaged in a painting or a project and derive enjoyment from the process. Because it is my hobby and not my job, I never get bored of creating, though I might get frustrated whenever I face problems in doing the work or some disruption in my environment. The authors go on to argue that to view art as something only talented people do is fatalistic. Even if it were true, it is a fatalistic view that offers no encouragement to the artist or those who would otherwise make art. They write, But while talent, not to mention fate, luck and tragedy, all play the role in human destiny, they hardly rank as dependable tools for advancing your own art on a day-to-day -day basis. What they are saying is that in the real world in which art is made, the power and responsibility for one's actions lies with the individual. They then go on to discuss assumptions about human nature and challenge the incorrect but common assumption that art only manifests as a result of innate talent. By comparison, they argue, while art is wrongly assumed to be the product of natural talent, craft is readily accepted as an activity that can be learned by anyone. In reality, to be an artist, they say, individuals must first learn to accept themselves. This leads to the work being personal and distinctive, depending on the degree to which the artist has developed her own skills and voice. These qualities can be nurtured by others, they argue, stating, even talent is rarely distinguishable in the long run from perseverance and lots of hard work. To combat the commonly held view of art being the product of superhuman talent, they point out that it is ordinary people and not superheroes who make art. The flaws and weaknesses with which we approach our work thus become the source of our strength in overcoming the challenges and obstacles we meet along the way. It's difficult to picture the Virgin Mary painting landscapes or Batman throwing pots, they write. If you try, both examples are genuinely difficult to picture unless they are being parodied. They go on to explain that art is terrifying because it has a way of revealing to us uncomfortable truths about ourselves. When we make a piece of art, it makes visible the gaps in our skills and knowledge what we set out to create gets lost in what we end up with. Instead, we should view this as valuable feedback that art has to offer. They then talk about the doer versus the viewer. For the people viewing the art, much of the attention is on the finished product. For the artist, they say, all that really matters is the process and what entailed in reaching the final result. The authors state, that as the doer of the art, the artist's concerns are not the same as the viewer's. Although the artist may well fall into the trap by developing the viewer's attitudes and mindsets, such as focusing on the end product rather than the process and experience that shaped the artwork, they write, the function of the overwhelming majority of your artwork is simply to teach you how to make a small fraction of your artwork that soars. Even masters make mistakes, they say. Scans of paintings made by famous artists show the mid-course corrections they made during the process. Therefore, even the failed pieces offer insights and something from the experience to carry forward to the next work. The best way to stay motivated to create art, they say, is to create art that we care about 
as often as possible. They talk about learning how not to quit and offer strategies that can help us to do this. Artists quit when they anticipate failure or do not find a destination for their work. This is particularly the case when the work reaches a point of diminishing returns. The authors make the point to differentiate between quitting and stopping. They write, Quitting is fundamentally different from stopping. The latter happens all the time. Quitting happens once. Quitting means not starting again. And art is all about starting again. Even after finding success, they point out, some artists see their success lead into depression, which causes them to stop making art or quit altogether. For the authors in making art, there must remain some loose threads and unresolved issues in the work that is to be carried forth to the next piece where it can be revisited and explored. The current goal should not be the only goal when making art, is the point. The authors include a list of strategies to avoid quitting, which includes the advice to make friends with people who make art and share your progress with them often as possible, as well as taking interest in their work. They go on to say that fears such as I'm no good, no one likes my art, no one understands my art, and other similar fears are more to do with the artists themselves than their artwork. They write, After all, in making art, you bring your higher skills to bear upon the materials and ideas you must care about. Art is a high calling, fears are coincidental, sneaky, and disruptive. What they mean here is that feeling lazy or resistance in making art or being distracted by the achievements of others are really disguises that mask the fear we have in putting our best efforts into making art. The difference between artists and ex-artists is that the former challenge their fears and so continue. Those who don't simply quit. What I took from this book is that flawed humans will make bad art and find the processes testing and challenging for their current level of skills. Not only that, we struggle to even define what exactly is art in a changing world. It is natural to feel fear when learning or trying something new for the first time. We can even feel fear when doing the things we normally do, if at any stage we encounter a problem we have yet to resolve. In order to overcome our fears, we thus need to shift to a mindset that focuses on making art that reflects what we value and care about. This means that we must work on our art through all the seasons, that too with the awareness that there will always be more to learn which will induce fear. By recognising our fears for what they are and seeing the role they play in holding us back from making our best art, we can challenge and overcome them. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you found it useful, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe for similar videos. Remember, life is short, art is long. I hope you enjoy your day. See you in the next one.